and you can also earn from your own business, right? But when you're a business owner, you have tax, what I like to call tax advantage income, because you have a lot of ways to lower the effect of that income. Now, it doesn't change the fact that you had that money and you had something to do with it, but it will change how much of that you got to give to the government. Welcome back to another episode of Angels, Exits, and Acquisitions. I'm here today with Carl Schilling, and Carl is the author of The Middle Class Millionaire Plan. And it's a free book, and you'll learn how to get access to that in the show notes. One of the things I loved about this is that we're talking about something that is not mainstream. It's definitely something that most people don't understand, have never heard about. And it's how to build wealth using a really unique vehicle that anybody has access to that's also going to protect you from estate taxes and help you grow your wealth tax-free and create generational wealth and leaving a legacy. So really excited for you to listen to this. And as always, like, subscribe, and share, and leave some comments. Take care. Welcome to Angels, Exits, and Acquisitions, the place to learn how to fund, scale, exit, and massively profit as an angel investor or entrepreneur. Brought to you by the Angel Investors Network. And now, here's your host, Jeff Barnes. All right. Welcome back to another episode of Angels, Exits, and Acquisitions. I'm here with our guest today, Carl Schilling. Carl, how are you? I'm great. I'm great. It's great to be with you, Jeff. Wonderful. Thanks so much for being here. I'm really excited about this conversation. Uh, I was looking through your background a little bit earlier and learning a little bit more about you, and you were the author of The the Middle Class Millionaire, so I'm really excited to talk about that. But before we dive into all of that, why don't you tell folks a little bit about yourself, some of your background? Sure, sure. uh, I've been around the financial services industry for a good better portion of, say, 44 years. And it's been kind of interesting because it's taken me through um, a lot of different areas. You know, I started out as a life insurance salesman so I could coach baseball. And uh, I had a background playing baseball and coaching for years. So the only thing I could do was get a job where you didn't have to work nine to five. And so selling insurance became uh, kind of unique to me. So I knew nothing about the life insurance industry when I first came in it. So I learned a great deal there. And then um, after about 20 years in that, um, while I was uh, uh, back in, I went from New York to Florida to South Carolina, back to uh, Florida. And um, I got invited back to Florida from South Carolina in the midst of uh, the late 90s, early 2000s. And uh, that was to be in the resort real estate business. So learned quite a bit about, um, you know, quite a bit about pre-construction, uh, the idea of being a, a <clears throat> whether you were a trailblazer or you were a pioneer or you were an end user. So that was an interesting um, education. Um, and I like to equate it to peanut butter and chocolate because I came from a financial side of the street. And on the real estate side of the street, I'd call that peanut butter. And the financial side, the equity side, I'd call chocolate because they don't tend to touch each other. You know, they don't want to mix. So for me, I was always talking to people about creating a peanut butter cup because both sides worked out very well for you. You know, you you should have real estate in your portfolio, obviously, and you should have equity in your portfolio and other things. And life insurance is a unique asset that has nothing to do with the other two, you know, and maybe it's a binder for the peanut butter cup. And then lastly, I, uh, I had a short run through uh, the investor relations industry, which uh, taught me a whole new way of seeing things because those guys were actually printing money. And on the other side of the street, you know, I was either earning money or trying to help people earn money, but these guys were basically printing money. So that led me, I wrote a book, you might be getting scammed when during that period of time. So uh, so that's it. So it's, it's, it's been a nice run. And um, here I am. Uh, I just turned 70 this year and I feel um, got another 15, 20 years of me, hopefully. Beautiful. I love that. And thanks so much for being here. I love that story too. So when I was in the Navy, uh, I was always trying to figure out ways to make money because you don't get paid much for being a knuckle dragon mechanic on a submarine. Um, and so I went to an opportunity night at a company called Primerica, you might be familiar with. And, oh, absolutely. You know, 
started my career as becoming a financial planner. And after several years of that, I realized, man, I am, and not being very good at it, by the way, I am nothing more than a glorified salesperson selling somebody else's products, selling life insurance and mortgages and eventually work on your securities licenses to get to sell mutual funds. It's like, it's not what I thought it was going to be, you know? And so I, I remember learning about the financial services industry from, you know, kind of at an arm's length distance in one of those larger companies, because at the time they were owned by Citigroup and whatnot. And I ended up in the, after that, I actually ended up uh, getting a job doing equipment breakdown and technology insurance uh, for a company that was owned by AIG and eventually owned by Mediagree Insurance. And so I got involved in the financial service space. And to your point, I got to now see it from the inside, right? So you're seeing it from the outside, you're seeing it from the inside. They're completely different animals. So many different ways to make money, so many different ways for people to use these different asset classes and not only create wealth, but protect and preserve their wealth along the way, right? And I think a lot of people misunderstand that there are, they are very, very different things, right? There's making money, then there's saving money, then there's investing, and then there's preserving, right? And so um, love, love that you have that, that in advanced background, if you will, of all these different areas. So with your, you, you wrote a book called The Middle Class Millionaire. You got this middle class millionaire plan. You, you've done a lot of these things and you might be getting sand when it sounds like your, your real focus is helping, you know, the blue collar community of the world try and understand how they can sort of level up when it comes to finances. Am I on, on, the, on to something there? Yeah, yeah. Um, historically, uh, you know, look, when I cut my teeth in the financial services, and, and you'll, you'll appreciate this because you were there too, it's all about the retirement uh, marketplace, okay? So, you know, and I was drinking the Kool-Aid. I, you know, I, I did, obviously, and I didn't think much about it. And then when I got to sit down and really kind of consider maybe 20 years ago, um, just about the turn of the 2000, I started to realize, well, th- this message is ridiculous. You know, so the message at that time was basically um, <clears throat> save more, spend less, and pay down debt. And that was the message. And then I found that the financial uh, advisory guys were talking to their retired people. Now, they were retired, okay? And the new message to them while they're retired was, you know, uh, spend less, uh, uh, save more, and pay down debt. I said, well, isn't that what you told me on the way here to retirement? So now you're telling me in retirement. So I realized there was a great fallacy there. And, and what was it? So it dawned on me, and it never dawned on me while I was younger, Jeff. This is amazing, because I wish it would have happened in my 30s. I wish I would have woke up. But I came to realize that the issue wasn't about spending. It wasn't about saving, because people, you don't need to educate someone on how to save. If they had something to save, they save it. You know, if they had uh, less spending, they, they would learn how to be less spending, right, and paid out of debt. I realized the issue was income. It was create more income. So if you were a business owner and treating your personal life like you would treat a business, not that you turn your family into a business, but just from the financial aspect, you'd realize that I need more income. I need to create and develop more income. Now, do I need another job? Do I got to work three jobs? Well, that's silly. I, I can create income without having to work a job. I can create income by having a business. And I could create a business based on something I was either good at something I loved or, or, or franchise or, or any number of things. So when I wrote the Middle Class Millionaire Plan, I wrote it because I knew that middle class people were never being educated on these things. Yeah, you had rich dad, poor dad, and, and they tried to do a reasonable job of educating people on this mindset. But um, a lot of it missed. So what I did, and we'll get into this, I don't want to get too long on it. We'll get into it. But what I did was to simplify it and say, look, you got to create more income. So how are you going to do that? You got to have three types of income. You got to have direct residual and passive income, or you're not going anywhere, right? You can have direct, there's doctors. They got direct income through the gazoo and they're still broke. You know, they still have no financial independence. So um, people can get direct income. Now the residual and passive side seems to be where people of wealth are educated, people of mass affluence and down, not so much. You know, they're not familiar. So that's where my combination of making a business 
and creating a bank with your life insurance comes into play. That's where the whole thing came into play. And people said, well, Carl, the middle class people don't have the money for this. And I said, yes, they do. They have the assets. They just don't know what to do with them. They have equity in their home and they have a 401k. Those two assets can be ex- changed right into financial independence right away. So that's what the middle class millionaire plan was really all about. It was trying to create financial independence by creating more income and developing an exit strategy for your future. I love that. And, you know, I wrote this book, The Ultimate Guide to Self-Directed Investing and Retirement Planning back in 2012. And it was, it was because it was post-financial crisis and we we're doing real estate investing and we saw the same thing. Everybody's wealth that had any at all was tied up in their home or their retirement plans. And what were they doing with it? Well, if it was their home, they weren't doing anything with it, right? Um, in the state that I live in, Washington State, they decide to reassess your home every couple of years, sometimes every year. So if the market's good, all of a sudden you're paying more in taxes. So you're actually losing money by having a home because you're starting to have to pay more in taxes, even if it's paid off, right? Uh, And it's a terrible waste. We call it a lazy asset. And then your retirement plan. And so I started doing the math on this. And I started kind of looking into all these big companies, the Vanguards, the Fidelities of the world, the Charles Schwab's, and understanding more and more about how did these guys make their money? And... If you're a certified financial planner, you're a registered investment advisor, sure, you might make money based off of how well you do for your clients. But the big guys don't, right? They make money just because you place a deposit with them. So they don't care if the market goes up, the market goes down, they're making money both ways, doesn't matter. And we looked at that and, and everybody has heard, you know, you know, compound interest, the eighth wonder of the world. It's an amazing thing. Well, guess what? It works in reverse too, right? If all of a sudden you're paying these fees, these (laughs) fees are coming out of what you should be making. You're making a lot less in the long run. So this fallacy, and I I had the same epiphany as you, is like this fallacy that I'm going to work for 40 years. I'm going to put a percentage of my money away. It's going to grow at 12% per year. The standard thing that every financial planner says, put it in the stock market, mutual funds on average over long term, 12% per year. You're going to have this much money by the time you retire, right? Well, let's face it. We all have lives. We have emergencies that come up. We have things that happen. We have jobs that change. It's not like you're putting the exact same amount of money in every single time, you know, and, and the markets do take a massive dive. And when they take a massive dive, like they did during the financial crisis, like they did, you know, the beginning of COVID, right? There was a giant drop right away. A lot of people, what happens? They pull their money out and they don't put it back in before the market goes back up. And so they miss out on all the upswing, right? And I saw this happening, like, and you know, needs you. Multiple streams of income. We got to figure this out. And, you know, I, I think that I think was it Robert Allen wrote one yeah. of the books around that. Um, I got a chance to yeah, meet Robert. Great book. I did too. Yeah. Long time back. Mm. Yeah. And so, like I said, I think we have a lot of uh, similarities when it comes to the mindset of money. Right. And so, I would guess that that's probably one of the biggest things you end up talking to a lot of people about is the mindset of money, the mindset of wealth and having to untrain everything they've learned up to that point before they got to you, right? Well, the, the, here's the thing. The, uh, the middle class has never been shown. Uh, like when I, when I talk about building a bank and a life insurance contract, it's not what a lot of people out there are doing. You know, I, okay. I, had, I was fortunate to meet, um, um, I, I, it, it'll come back to me in a second, but I met him many years ago, okay? Um, you know, who wrote the book on building the Nelson, Nelson Nash, Nelson Nash. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm out a long, long time ago. And, uh, Nelson Nash, what most companies and uh, not companies per se, cause most of them don't even like the concept, but most of the agents who are out there doing this concept have bastardized it into a, a miniature kind of thing that does not work. You know, like I won't mention, I won't mention the people who were pushing that, but I will say that they, they say you can do it with $600 a month, with $800 a month. You can't. You can't do it the right way. You need to do about $2,000 a month, you know, or, and have it built properly. When I say built properly, you don't have an agent who's a pig, who's taking all, all death benefit and taking a lot of commissions. You know, we build it properly, right? With the right blend. And I'm not going to give that away because, you know, obviously it's a good formula. Anyway. When you show a middle-class person this, 
the first thing that happens to them is they don't get the ticket, they don't get the uh, sticker shock that you think they'd get. They get the sticker shock that, oh, I can never afford that. But when they see the numbers and they realize how this builds uh, uh, instant liquidity, how it builds tax-free income, how it builds generational wealth, which is a key that no one pays attention to, right? Yeah. And, and how it builds uh, liquidity, tax-free liquidity for chronic, critical, and, and, and uh, terminal illness. So it has all that built in, right? And it's a nice asset. So when they see that, they're amazed. And they say, well, you know, Carl, I can't afford $2,000. Well, I said, of course you can't. But I can show you, based on your assets that you have now, how this thing could be built. Also, if it's not ready now, we'll put you in a position so we show you how to build it and come back and put that income in, okay? So that's where we start with the 401k. And here's where I'm going to get tomatoes and everything thrown at me because I'm, I'm an anti-401k guy, okay? Um, not because I thought it was a bad idea or anything, but it's a, it's a partnership with the government. That's not a great partner. The government has all of the decisions in the partnership. I have none. So basically, I gave away, I took a tax deduction in the lowest tax period of my life to put dollars away that may or may not grow to pay a higher tax rate when I take it out. It, it makes no sense to me, you know, now. I mean, don't get me wrong. I was drinking the Kool-Aid and, and selling it, but then I realized, sure. come on now, this is not right. So I counsel people on getting out, uh, get out of the 401k now. We have a way to get out tax-free. We have a way to roll you out, build your own business, create your own business. You don't got to leave your job if you don't want to. Keep your job. You got a business. You got all the 401k funds. They're all in your hands. You're betting on yourself. You build a bank with the life insurance. You've got tax-free liquidity. You've got tax-free income. And you've got generational wealth. You build the business, you got tax advantaged income, you got capital appreciation, and you got an exit strategy. Yep. It's a beautiful thing. Okay. And uh, if you fail, at least you fail. You know, the stock market, you, 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 it's your share. Zero control. It's your yeah, corporation, control. you're betting on yourself. Before continuing, please subscribe and share this video to help us reach more people and stay notified of our latest releases. Now, let's continue watching and learning. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of people are going to be like, okay, scratching their heads. What does he mean? My own bank and with life insurance. And I know what you're referring to. At least I'm pretty sure I know what you're referring to when it comes to Nelson, Nash, Nelson Nash's uh, privatized banking concept and the infinite banking concept. So can you explain in... in layman's terms, what does that mean? Because most people that are listed is like, nah, I don't, it sounds too woo-woo crazy for me. Right. Well, in Nash's world, what he did, and you know, he was a forester, which is an interesting story because you know how foresters are. They don't plant a tree for their own lifetime. They plant a tree for, you know, hundreds of years from now. But um, he figured out that the component of the life insurance contract called dividends. Now, you know, a lot of people are using the IULs, which is the index universal life, because they want to compare it to a uh, investment. And I want to say this to all your audience, to everybody, life insurance is not an investment, never was meant to be, never going to be. It's two different things. Now, it can have an internal rate of return. It can, it can grow a lot of money for you, but it's a, a long-term vehicle, right? And it's not an investment. And it does things that other investments cannot do. But here's a theory. You put so much money, you, you got something, you got a legal ability to put uh, X amount of money into a life insurance contract before it becomes a taxable event. Right? They call that a modified endowment contract. So that's, I was hoping you were going to mention that because that's the part where I get a little confused. Okay. So that modified endowment contract simply means... You, you've got less death benefit and too much money in the contract for it to endow properly because the cash value portion of the, pro of the policy, and this is why dividend paying whole life is the best one, they can never call it a gain. It's never a gain, ever. The cash value is actuarially determined. It's just going to endow the death benefit, whether it's up to your year of 121 now or whatever it is, right? 
You're alive at 121. You paid your premiums. The cash value now equals the death benefit. Okay, that's an actuarial deal. So every year, your cash value grows based on an actuarial number. The second component, though, is the big one. The second component is a dividend. A dividend is simply the company returning you a portion of your premium at the end of the year. That's a dividend. Now, because that's a return of premium, again, that's not your typical dividend like on a stock or something, right? It's not a gain. So the government can never tax it as such or will look for it as such. So now you've got two components, three, really. You've got a death benefit, you've got cash value, and you've got dividend. And when you build the dividends with what's called, uh, we call it paid up additions. So it's a, what you can use for dividend. Those little paid up additions all have a little death benefit. So you're buying a little mini, with each paid up addition, you're buying a mini life insurance contract. So you're increasing the death benefit and you're also at the same time increasing, so it's compounding. So the dividends compound on themselves. They're compounding themselves. So mm -hmm. after seven or eight years, you cross over. In seven or eight years, you cross over. The amount of premium you put in, your cash value and your dividend value are going to now start to be higher than the premiums you pay. And now you start gaining very rapidly. And by the way, because the dividend structure is a little life insurance, your life insurance grows as well. So that's what they mean about the bank. Now, all that money on the cash value and dividend side is totally liquid. Anytime you want it, it's yours. Okay. Yeah. So I think that's, that's a concept that people will not understand, right? Cause it, we're used to like the world that I grew up in, buy a term and invest the difference, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which by the way, which no one listens to is that 90, I think it's 97% of all term insurance policies never pay out. Yeah. So the death benefits, only 3% of them ever pay. So life insurers love term insurance, okay? They love term insurance because they're never going to pay a claim. Um, the, the benefit of whole life, which has been knocked around and, and, and bad mouth for years, right? Um, the benefit of whole life, it's always going to be there. Death benefits get paid out, okay? Uh -huh. Now, if the policy is used properly, it can become a great asset and all the cash tax-free. And that liquidity, you can use anytime you want. Like I tell people, look, okay, let me give you an example of that 2000 a month, right? Say it's 2000 a month, 24000 a year. At the end of year one, there's $16,000 in cash value at the end of year one. No matter what age you are, it doesn't make a difference what age you are. The only thing that changes is the death benefit, right? You're 35, you're 55, it doesn't make a difference. 55, you get less death benefit. 35, you get more death benefit. It's the same dollars. You, you know what I mean, Jeff? So, Okay. So oh, here's, yeah. here's the magic of it. The end of year one, you got $16,000 in cash value. You can do whatever you want to do with that money. You can borrow it out, put it into investment. You can go back into the stock market. You could get real estate. You do whatever you want to do with it. Now that's going to grow each year. So each year, $16,000 additionally is going to grow on top of that from the 24 you put in. Okay. So there's only $8,000 being used against the death benefit. Uh -huh. And that's why this thing grows so substantially. So the numbers, when you're 65, 70, 75 years old, the numbers are pretty, you know, we're trying to build a million dollar deal. You know, it doesn't work for every age. You know, it depends, right? But, you yeah. know, uh, 750, 800, almost all the time. Well, and even to the point of, you know, let's think about it from the standpoint of building a legacy, a legacy, a legacy, a legacy right? Generational wealth. And, you know, I've heard that the Rockefellers use a strategy like this. And we think about a, a lot of people go, this is so far out of my reach and I don't get it. And why would I do this? Like, let's just say they're even in their sixties and they say, well, why would I do this? This isn't going to benefit me. Well, first off, yeah, I bet will. Cause guess what? We're living a lot longer, right? So you could live in to be a centenary and be over a hundred years old. But also is there a way for like a lot of people that are starting to make money you know, which uh, the baby boomer generation, the vast majority of their wealth is tied up in their retirement plans and their, for, and their uh, businesses, right? And so there's this massive wealth transfer that's underway right now. It's just phenomenal how much money is changing hands. 
But there's also this incredible thing called the estate tax and the death tax. And depending on where you live and what's your tax bracket, like you could lose a lot of this and give it back to the government, which I abhor, right? Because right now we're paying what, 75 to 80 cents on every dollar is going to pay off the interest on the debt the government has accumulated in great our point. income. Yeah. Great so, point. so why would we give them our money when we can give it to the next generation? So I'd imagine there's a way for them to leverage this to start building up an estate or a legacy for themselves. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Nelson Nash, I don't know all the exact numbers, but just give me a rough idea. Uh, my understanding is when he died, uh, and he passed away a little over a year ago or so, give or take, you know, less than two years, I think, right? Uh, late 80s. He left his family like $32 million, you know, in, 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 uh, in death benefit. Um, but he had used his cash values his entire life. There was a point where, now he had to do more than one policy. Obviously, he had probably 15 life insurance policies, 16, right? But he was taking all his monthly income and it was all going to the insurance carrier. And then when he wanted to take money out to pay bills or whatever he did, he just took loans off his policy. Right. That's it. But the trick was he paid back his loan. Because his whole, you know, your loan is, uh, uh, it's a net, you know, it's non-recourse in a life insurance contract. It'll come off your death benefit. You don't have to pay it back. But it'll grow if you don't pay the interest. And yeah. it, it'll net off the death benefit, which that's a mistake a lot of people make. But you got to at least pay the interest. You know, and again, it's one of those things that, you know, you've already, and, and to your point, and this is the thing that I thought was just so criminal, um, you know, a lot of people don't even realize this, but up until 1930, we didn't even have a federal income tax, right? Um, we didn't have this thing called the central bank and they were in control of the money supply. And there's so much, you know, we go down to you know, where Griffin's talk on uh, this creature from Jekyll Island and talk about all of that stuff. Um, but the fact is that if you still believe that Paying an income tax is you know, not just the right thing to do, but you know you expect to be paying more throughout your life. Well, good on you, I guess. But the government's always going to borrow the money they need or just print more. So our obligation is to pay the minimum amount that we're required to pay, in my opinion, right? Because the fact is that we have an obligation to ourselves and our families first. And yes, our country is there and I love our country. Hey, I just don't trust my government, um, but I love our country. And I really do want to see my family succeed. I do want to see my country succeed, but I think I, family's got to come first, right? And so if you're thinking about this in the stance of, from the stance of how do I make sure my family is taken care of, right? Well, roof over our head, you need all the food, you need all the clothing, you need to have a good lifestyle, all that sort of stuff. To your point, you have a job. You're making money. If you have a W-2, roughly anywhere from 30 to 50 plus percent of your, and every dollar you make is going to the government one way, shape or form or another, between property taxes and sales taxes and income taxes and all these different things. But if you can find a way to start offsetting those taxes or taking the money that's already been taxed and put it into a way that's going to grow, because this is the other sad right. part. You put money into you know, these retirement plans and some of them you get taxed while you're putting it in and you get taxed while you're taking it out. Some of them, if you do a Roth style, okay, yeah, you get taxed first and then you don't get taxed later, but those are still very limited. But why would you ever continue to pay taxes if you don't have to? I guess that's the point that I want to make is that, you know, be smart with your money so you can save more of it now and you have, have the part that's, you know, save more of it so you can grow it and compound it further down the road. Well, when you, when you get into the uh, the core of the middle class, who's not a uh, business ownership middle class, let's say uh, you know under that four hundred thousand dollar, but even under two hundred, and say you're 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 an earner, you're just an earner, earner right? Uh, historically, you pay too much tax because you really don't pay attention to it because you're an earner and the money's coming out and you know all that good stuff, right? Um, but when you're a business owner. And you could be an earner at the same time. And you could also earn from your own business, right? But when you're a business owner, you have tax, what I like to call tax advantage income, because you have a lot of ways to lower the effect of that income. Now, it doesn't change the fact that you had that money and you had something to do with it, but it will change how much of that you got to give to the government. Yeah. And, and this is where people 
miss a lot of that. And that's why, see, now I always talk about life insurance carriers, and I'll tell you why, because I, I still believe this with my heart. I really do. I'm not, you know, I'm not a zealot for life insurance at all, you know, in that sense. But there is no greater financial tool than life insurance. It has kept families afloat through the Civil War, World War I, World War II, the Korean War, every war you know of, you know, the, the life insurance carriers survive. Now, you can't say that about banks. And most banks right now, it's something like, it's, it, it's like several trillion dollars that banks own in life insurance. So if it's good enough for the banks, it it's probably should be good enough for average Joe, right? Yeah, and, absolutely. And average Joe can do things with it that, that people don't recognize. And wealthy have done, like you mentioned, Rockefellers and all those, the wealthy have done this for decades, you know, really? literally a hundred years, way back when, and they knew how to do it. And it's because of that tax advantage income of the life insurance contract. Okay. Now it doesn't work unless you overfund it, you know, but, but right. like, like you mentioned, the thing that, uh, uh, you know, Ben Feldman and others made their careers on was selling life insurance to people to protect their estate tax, you know, and that's what the real wealthy do, you know, now they finance that life insurance. They even finance life insurance for them to do that kind of thing, right? But um, getting back to the middle class guy, I we, we can take the money from the 401k and move it tax-free. Now, when I say tax-free, let's say it's not taxable now. That's what we're saying. Some point in the future, you want to be successful. Yeah, there'll be some taxation. It won't be like taking the money out of your 401k, but there'll be some taxation because your business was successful. Right. Right. But you can control that. Again, that's up to you. Uh, the second thing is to have the life insurance bank as part of it, because that's that's the thing that's going to be the whole foundation for you, for your family. Right. Uh, if you're not there to finish the business, whether it's partnership or whether it's your family, guess what? You left behind the wealth that paid it all off. And they can sell the asset, that business asset. You know, yeah. they've got the money or buy it. If, you know, they don't have to buy it, obviously, unless it's partners involved. But um, it, it's just, you know, it's just sad to me that we live in the richest nation in the world. And at the same time, we got the highest level of financial illiteracy in the world. And personally, I think it's by design. I think, you, you know, I don't think the, I don't, and again, I'm not a uh, conspiracy guy, conspiracy guy, but I don't think that the powers that be uh, are interested in, everybody in society being financially literate. Yeah, because no, I, was, uh, um, I don't know if it was uh, J.P. Morgan that said it or if it was Rockefeller that said it, but you know, I don't want a nation of bakers. I want a nation of work. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, and, and the fact is that's what we got. And we have an entire system built around that and people are suffering the consequences. But until they start hearing that there's alternatives, they hear of different ways to do things and they wake up to the idea that maybe there's a better way, you know, we're going to be in that situation for a while. And even though I'd love to talk and spend more time going into that, Carl, we sure. are at times. So yeah. um, I really appreciate your time today, but why don't you tell folks how they can find find you online and learn more about you? Well, you can find us at uh, online at middleclassmillionaireplan.com, you know, obviously the old uh, website. Um, I can be reached directly and I'm always available. You know, I'm not one of those guys like uh, the president of the United States who's got a calendar. Um, <laughs> but you can reach me at three, two, one, nine, four, seven, three, two, two, zero. And again, uh, the book is free on the website. I suggest everybody read the book and then we can have a private consultation. It's, you know, no arm twisting, very simple. Beautiful. I love it, Carl. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. There's been a lot of great information and I love being able to talk about these types of things that are yeah, not part of the mainstream and can really help a lot of folks. So thank you again so much for being here. Well, thank you, Jeff. Appreciate the time. Absolutely. And you've been listening to the Angels Exits and Acquisitions podcast. So as always, like, subscribe, and share. And if you're listening or watching, go check out the show notes because we'll have all the information for Carl in there. Take care. <laughs>